Hello, and it looks like we're live. Hopefully we're live. Yes, ah, uh, yes, we're live. Hello, everybody in the group. Thank you so much for joining us for our first episode of the year of Bake Like a Vegan Pro, where once a month we chat with an amazing vegan baker or pastry chef or personality from around the world, and everyone can tune in for a live Q&A and ask all the questions that we want. This is going to be such a special episode, and it's amazing to kick it off in 2020 with the fantastic Fran Costigan. Hello, Fran. How are you? Well, I'm so excited. Hello. I'm happy to be here and to chat with everyone and to finally see Sarah face to face. It's really <laughs> a thrill, really a thrill for me. You too. Absolutely. Um, Wow, it's going to be such a great episode. So before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Fran. I am sure everyone in the group already knows her. She's an amazing uh, vegan pastry chef. She's a culinary instructor. She's a cookbook author. I actually have one of her cookbooks here, which is an absolute oh, must. You have to get a copy of it. It's just it's brilliant. Um, she's a pastry chef. She's a consultant, and she's the director of the v uh, vegan pastry school at Ruby Culinary School online, which is an, an internationally re uh, renowned as an authority on vegan desserts. And I've actually done this course myself, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so Fran has been teaching and uh, being a, teaching vegan baking and being a culinary instructor for over twenty five years. So she is an absolute superstar in this space probably the first in the world that has had such a huge impact on the vegan baking scene um and you know she's just developed so many different baking techniques and given us all a solid foundation to grow from when it comes to vegan baking and vegan pastries so i will have all this information on my website on a dedicated page for friends so you can check out her books all about her history and definitely her school is a must now right before we get started i'll just tell you a quickly how today is going to run i'm going to break the interview up into three sections the first one uh first section we're going to allow fran to have a chat to us about like um, how she became a vegan pastry chef her journey doing that um, all the wonderful things that she's she has done and is currently doing now so feel free to ask any questions um, as she talks about that journey. In the second section, we're going to talk about her top dessert tips and baking tips and what advice she would give to someone who's wanting to have a professional career as a vegan pastry chef. And then the third part of the interview, we're going to talk about all her amazing assets like her cookbooks, her school, her blog, um, her personally as a consultant. And please feel free in this section to ask any questions whatsoever. Yeah. And I'll be pushing the interview along just to make sure we stay on time. So, Fran, I'm going to hand it over to you now. So, please tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, and how you Sarah, it. thank you for that unbelievable <laughs> introduction. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, feel like I should have a crown on my head. That was very nice of you. Thank you. No it's just my absolute pleasure to be here with you and everybody who's here who shares this passion wherever you are in the you know beginning just curious or working as a pastry chef Ma, and then I'm going to ask you Sarah to, Sarah to make sure that I stay on track because man I can talk about this stuff. Good, good. I want to hear everything I'm so you know I just feel so passionate about this yes I have been doing this for quite a very long time and I was telling Sarah when we were making sure that the sound was up, you folks are really lucky because when I started, I, ch I went through traditional pastry school. So I will tell you that, professional school. And I went as an adult. I already had my children were just sort of young, pre teeny things. I grew up on terrible food. My mother hated to cook. So just frozen TV dinners and box cakes and stuff like that. But I became very interested in in food. I noticed wherever I went in the world, you know, I just wanted to shop and, and then the pastries really got me. So I went through New York restaurant school, as, which I said was traditional. This was a, a very long time ago. I have four grandchildren. And I started working as a pastry chef in Manhattan 
and I loved the work. I had a really tough boss and she loved what I was doing. I was not vegan. This was about 35 years ago. And um, I, the stomach aches that had plagued me my whole entire life were getting worse and worse. So I had to leave my dream job. I mean, this is what I dreamed about doing. And then I went into rock and roll management, but that's a whole other story <laughs> or another time. And the band was doing this like blah, over and over and over again. And I happened to pick up a book called Food and Healing by Anne-Marie Colvin, who had a school called the Natural Gourmet Institute. Some of you may know about the school recently got folded into the Institute of Culinary Education. But Marie was so ahead of her time. And just brilliant woman and really was my mentor. And so I saw, you know, I was in Palm Springs, Palm Desert, and pick up this book. And here I'm living in New York and I didn't know about the school. So I called the school and registered for food and healing course and all these things. And I thought, well, it must be the dairy. You know, I never could tolerate milk or anything like that. My mom gave me ice cream for breakfast to get the dairy into me. Maybe that's why I, maybe that's why I started. It's like eating. every child's dream, right? And, um, but I gave up all animal foods really without thinking about it. And literally within three days, I, I just was, wow. My stomach aches went away. My weight stabilized. My moods were better. And then, you know, you you can't unlearn what you, you, it just started me on a path and I learned about the animals and I learned about everything and I never looked back. So speaking of back, <laughs> then my pastry chef friends literally turned their back on me and said, well, you're not a chef anymore because if you're not gonna, if you can't taste these things, then, you know, goodbye. Of course, now they're, for many years now, they've been coming and saying, uh, would you do a little class? Would you, we need to know about this and so on. I brought a um, cake, my Ebinger's Black, Brooklyn Blackout cake, which is chocolate cake filled and frosted with chocolate pudding and crumbs all over, which is a very iconic New York cake. I brought it to a professional event one night a few years ago. And these, you know, these chefs said, oh, you're not vegan anymore. I mean, you know, so I've gone from having to defend, just try it, it's vegan, to, yeah, it really is vegan. But back then, we didn't have, you know, you go to the market now, right? And you look at all the different plant milks, for example, and cream mm -hmm. and whatever. Yeah. We were pretty much mixing soy milk powder and water. It was disgusting. And in my first job in a vegan restaurant, the only shortening was hydrogenated stick margarine. And it smelled. So even beyond the it's not good for you, it was just like didn't taste good. Now I'm like a kid in a candy store because look at all these, literally a candy store, look at all these yeah. ingredients. But because, because I started a long time ago, so I said, well, I better make a real test kitchen and see what I can do to create desserts that aren't just good for what they are, but fabulous. You know, I say to people all the time, have you never had a conventional dessert that was bad? I have. So we want to make things that really good taste delicious. And um, I got over this, you know, for a very little while, I was like, oh, well, I feel so good now. Desserts can't be good for you. And then my son, who was about 11, I think, said, you're not putting a candle in a sweet potato and telling me that's my birthday cake. So that, <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> I had a point. And when I started teaching, the people who were like, I never eat sweets. I want to be a healthy vegan. They were drinking maple syrup in the back of the room. So, okay, fast forward. I go into the test kitchen. I'm like, I'm going to make a cake that's fabulous. That won't matter. You know, take, and also I recommend to people, don't say, because you do when you're excited, you're not going to believe what's not in this. <laughs> Just let the food speak for itself. We eat with our eyes. We want something that's attractive. I use real ingredients, you know. But the fact is that there was no commercial egg replacer when I was doing this. So most of my batter-based desserts are baking powder, baking soda, vinegar, 
they don't have a flax egg replacer, or there certainly wasn't even aquafaba when I wrote the chocolate book. Um, so I've gone back in and you know playing with these new ingredients, but you quality in, quality out. I use really good cocoa powder and the right kind of cocoa powder. You know, you have to know whether you do to use alkalized or non-alkalized, and I use the right sweeteners and so on. I had to learn all these things. So my most the cake that I call my breakthrough cake was my the chocolate cake to live for, which is still my most popular cake. And it's it's a cake. It can be a no oil added cake or no fat added cake for the whole food plant-based no oil people. It was Rip Esselstyn's wedding cake. It can be gluten made gluten-free. But I am really a stickler about there's no one size fits all. So when people say, how do you replace eggs? Or what if I want to make this recipe gluten-free? It you you have to do a lot of testing and tweaking, right? Yeah. Because yeah. applesauce can be used in some things, but it's not, you know, I want a really beautiful crumb. So for me, the idea is to have an absolute perfection on your plate, serve a smaller piece, you know, trick the eye, put some fruit on there. Uh, for people who are allergic to everything, you know, pretty much, okay, I can't have wheat, I can't have, I won't eat oil, this and that and the other thing. Make a beautiful baked apple or poach a pear, or make a lightly gelled fruit soup. So that, you know, that's really the way I think about it is we want to make yeah. delicious desserts. Just and I, I think that's a really good point that a lot of people who come into vegan baking um, don't realize that one egg replacer is not going to be the infinite re egg replacer for right. every single recipe. And when you start tinkering with recipes that you yourself have spent hours and hours and hours perfecting, you're not going to get the same result. So it's better just to find a recipe that suits your needs rather than trying to change yeah. the recipe. That's such a good point because... Um, People, there are so many good established vegan pastry chefs now and, and bakers with really yeah. fine recipes that are vetted. So you, people will write to me and say, well, I went to the internet <laughs> and I found this recipe for a frosting out of a book and there's one in particular, so I won't say, but I got a lot when the book came out and it melted. And I looked at the recipe and I'm like, well, of course it's going to melt. It's confectioner sugar and coconut oil. <laughs> All right. It's going to be pudding, you know, yeah. or sauce at room temperature. Yeah. You, the best thing that an aspiring pastry chef can do is learn about the ingredients, learn techniques. Now, if you can go to school, a school, that's great, whether it's a you know an actual physical school or an online course. When we developed the Ruby Essential Vegan Baking course, desserts course, it's ninety days. It took over a year to develop that course. I wanted it based on traditional technique, taste things, observe, and then what I still do to this day is I'll cut a recipe in half, maybe in a quarter by a quarter to do a test maintain the integrity of the dessert. So if it's a cake, I'm not gonna bake an eight inch cake, or maybe I'll bake a, make a six, maybe I'll make some cupcakes, but do the test that way until you get what you want. And then you learn over time, you learn, well, I can keep going with this if I'm in the mood, <laughs> or this really has to go, you know, this is not, but there are wonderful resources. And I also believe there and there are wonderful baking books now, dessert books by you know vegan superstars. We've got Hannah. We've we've, we've got so many. Just I have everybody's books here. You know Gretchen. There are so many people doing beautiful yeah. books. I'm waiting for one from you. I hope it's going to happen someday. It's a lot of work. Yeah, thank you, one. Marissa Wolfson is going to have a, a book coming out this year on um, children's. Raising vegan children, and she's an amazing cake artist too. 
but there's it's really important too to go to traditional technique and so i use a book called how baking works in the ruby course we have a, a reading list and not every book is vegan by a lot because when people used to think or would come i don't know if they used to think but these are questions i would get and then i would see somebody just say you don't have to measure correctly you don't have to sift you don't have to be so careful about ingredients are you kidding me yes you do i'm, I'm i mean i'm american but my scale <laughs> is set to gram weight <laughs> and yeah. yes you have to be very careful and and Check for yourself. For example, in the vegan chocolate book, we have American weight, you know, ounces and pounds, and we also have gram weight, which mm. was really hard to do. I had three interns, we were all measuring. But for example, the gluten-free flour that I was using at the time weighs differently from the gluten-free flour mix that I'm using now. So it's going to be yeah. off. One of yeah. my favorite former students who now works with me in Philadelphia, and she has a very serious day job, but she works with me. Every time she gets a new sack of flour, even though it's always from the same manufacturer, she uses King Arthur, she whips it and she weighs it and she writes it down. So for some people, this seems like a pain in the butt, <laughs> but for <laughs> other people, if you want a result that's going to be fabulous, then you need to do these things. I just yep. I don't know yep. if this is a Taza chocolate, which is a Mexican style chocolate. So it's gritty and it's used, it's very fair trade and organic and vegan and so on. But they just sent me um, their new Couverture chocolate. And I was very interested because it's a company I would like to work with and promote. But I use, you know, I certainly make a lot of ganache, but I do a recipe test with just two ounces of chocolate just to see what would happen. So, you know, that's something to do. So my advice to people who really want to do this professionally is learn as much as you can. There are a lot of resources. There are books, there are schools, there are online courses. And then go to... Um, somebody that you admire or a cafe and just say, Hey, you know, I would really like to work with you. I'd really like to work with you and see what mm. you can do and get a notebook and write things down. <laughs> That's I think you, you just covered so many very poignant points that uh, people need to um, really take on board if they're trying to get better at baking. And I learned this because I've been baking for five years now and I've gone through all of this. I started in cups and then realized that Australian cups aren't the same as American and that I should just right. be doing it by weight because it makes such a difference because people don't measure correctly. And that gluten-free flour actually weighs different than normal flour. So you can't just exchange yeah. and, and really paying attention to those, uh, details and understanding food science and trying to understand different types of formulas and you'll just improve and it's yeah. just like I'm still always always learning all the time and trying to improve my recipes and get as much knowledge as possible uh -huh. and everything you've just said I think is some really good foundation places for people to start instead of having to learn those lessons over you've just told everyone like make sure you're doing it in measurements because it's going to make a massive difference and try it test small amounts and yeah yeah you know it, it seems boring to some people i know but some of the top tips are measure correctly and pay attention yeah. if the recipe says overfill the cup or whatever it's different from pour you know spooning in so measuring will help you but the oven has to be at temperature. My, yeah, ovens, my oven dings, it's ready, but it's not because I have two oven thermometers in there. The oven yeah. rack placement makes a difference too. Yeah. Get a mise en place. This is something we stress at Ruby. And yesterday, or it was this morning, I actually made a fabulous new cream. I have to reverse engineer it because I didn't have my mise en place, which just made everything together as I should have, as I know better. And I poured this perfection into some, well, anyway, it wasn't good. So, <laughs> you know, 
pay attention, but those things really matter. And when I'm testing, I use ordinary equipment because most of my readers are, you know, I want everybody to be able to make things. I'm getting ready now to do a an event. This is, I'm going to an organization called ACF, American Culinary, American Culinary Federation. This is the chefiest of chefs. This is a certifying agency and they haven't, really been very interested to date in plant-based or vegan. So we know that everybody wants to know what we know now. So everyone who, who is here is at the right place at the right time because this knowledge is, you know, everybody, you know, people are really wanting to eat plant-based vegan in veganuary, however you want to reference this. And giving, and everyone wants dessert, right? I don't know anybody who doesn't want dessert. They look at yeah. the dessert first on the menu. <laughs> and giving a, a vegan menu or a dinner party or anything where you're offering a fruit plate, even if it's got a little bit of sorbet on it, give me a break. You know, that's like when the only thing on the menu is vegetables or maybe vegetables with pasta. So we don't want to do that. And, and we can learn from, it's important to learn from each other. You know, you talked about how you're continuing to learn. And I think the work you do is brilliant, Sarah. So Ma, Carolina Malia of L'Artisan Vegan Bakery in um, Miami, her vegan croissant won Best of Miami two years in a row in a blind tasting French contest. Can you just oh, turn, wow. turn around and saw well, she was one of my, she went through the Ruby course. She had also gone through Cordon Bleu as a traditional, she got traditional education as I did and then worked at the Four Seasons in Miami. And then the way she put it is she couldn't stand to see one more lobster going in the pot and she left. Yeah. And she began learning all she could about vegan desserts and her work is so fine. It's just, I can't, you should all look at L'Artisan the Instagram, her Instagram and her Facebook page and so on. Okay. I'll get all these um, recommendations off you as well to include in all the show yeah, notes. That would be good. So Carolina just gave a, a few, a month or so ago, just before Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, she decided to offer an advanced vegan pastry course. Now this is my student. I went down there, down there to take her course. Oh, I saw these photos. And I think Molly Lawrence as well went and did them. If Molly, you're online, she did photos too. Did you yeah. see Molly? Yeah. yeah. We met. Yeah. We met for the first time. So, you know, you, you, you just keep learning. You just keep learning. And and that's yeah. that's the way it is. So, you know, gorgeous. I'm going to be doing, I think, 300, 300 samples. This is, wow. you know, for people who aren't, who haven't had this in their life, and the answer is whether you're baking, you're doing desserts that are vegan, the same rules apply as when you're doing desserts that are traditional. Quality yep. ingredients, you know. If somebody writes to me and says, I made your coffee cake and it wasn't good. Oh, no, but I know <laughs> coffee cake is good. <laughs> well, yep. if you don't use flour, I took out the flour and I used oh yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. don't use sweetener, so whatever. You know, then sorry, it's dessert. Yeah. <laughs> just to keep every, just keep you on time. Um, hi, Auntie Julie. My auntie's just waving at me. She's just tuned in. Hi, Julie. Uh, can I just? I just want to move on to the next section now. That was uh -huh. such great um, insight and information from you. Can you share some of your top dessert and baking tips that you would give to people just starting out? Or things that you really think we need to know. I know you've talked a little bit about it already, but what specific, what's some specific right. advice? Well, I would say spend some time with um, looking at Sarah at the recipes from people in groups like Sarah's group. Yay! <laughs> no, ser seriously, there's a wealth of information there. There yeah. are think about resources. There are Facebook groups that are really good, like your group, Aquafaba Hits and Misses, 
is, you know, where you can get a lot of information. I also belong to a group called uh, Pastry Chefs which, Online, which is uh, a magazine. They aren't vegan, but I've been, these are working chefs, but I've been noticing there's a questions about it and things that I can yeah. learn. Books like, um, so let's see. This is a this is a really good book. It's called How Baking Works, and it's just it's like a text. Wow. It's like it's a text. encyclopedia. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Okay. And then a book like this, Pastry Chef's Companion, because you're bit you you want to do vegan desserts, but you still need to know about things. So you can look anything up here, and it will tell you, and then you can convert over. Um, this was, you know, an earlier book that I did that's not so pretty, but the recipes still hold. Follow people that you think are smart. If you can't go to a school, there are courses online that you can yep. take. Make sure, you know, look at the syllabus. Make sure that you're going to learn the basics. Pay attention. And, and also, I think when you're talking about online schools, because there have been quite a few vegan online schools that have popped up. Yes. I always recommend when you're doing something like that to get referrals from people that have actually done the course. 100%. To make sure you're getting the money's worth. Yeah. Yes, yes. There was a, a sad situation a few years ago with a school that just went. Yeah, there's been a couple, there's been two now that I've seen that happen. Yeah. Friends of mine have lost money. So, Lots like, I can, uh, Friends is the best one I've ever seen, mm. and the theory in it is fantastic. The video tutorials are awesome. Mm. Um, Friends does live event videos throughout your um, uh, tuition, and you. the great thing about it is you can do it with a group as well on a timeline where you're delivering over a period of three months, or otherwise, like I see, I didn't have enough time to do it right. in that space, but I was but I had access to it forever. So I'm constantly referring to it. It's self-paced, so there, it, there, it's three months. However, we do uh, give extensions to people. Life happens, you know? So there yes. are extensions. I would rather have people learn than rush through. There are quizzes, you know? I, I, and it's very interesting because I'll have, and I grade, you know, I grade everybody's, um, assignments but it's very interesting because i will frequently get an email saying i thought this was going to be really boring i didn't want to learn about agar i don't like gels but agar which comes in three forms and they are not interchangeable is a foundational ingredient that you need to learn to use if you're going to make some gorgeous creams and things and in combination with a starch slurry, whether it's, you know, arrowroot or tapioca starch, and all these things are not quite, they, they might be one for one, but they work a little bit differently. Arrowroot comes to a yes. thickened yes. right before the boil. Cornstarch has to be boiled for a minute. Tapioca starch is a little stretchier. It gets very interesting. And agar powder, I just answered a question for somebody. You know, I would, people would think, well, I can take agar flakes and just grind them up fine, but the strengths are very different. You know, they're mm. very different. And within the agar powder world, so agar is a sea vegetable and it's vegetable gelatin. And it's been used for millennia in Asian cuisine. So that's something else I look at, you know, is a food real? <laughs> and how does it work? Well, agar powder has a range of strengths. So it's quite amazing. So I always suggest when you make a recipe, let's say you've made a frosting or a ganache or a gel or a pudding, I have little tiny little pinch cups. All I have one cabinet all full of these little cups and little tiny spoons. And even if I have made a recipe, my vanilla cream that I made today, hundreds of times, each time I take a little bit, put it in a pinch cup, put it in my fridge, say, Alexa, set the timer for 10 minutes. And then, you know, before you have made the whole, you know, you put it away and you go, oh my God, my frosting is too thin or too thick or my 
ganache is too thin or too thick. This pudding isn't setting up. Well, you know, and then you can go ahead and adjust it. And that's the way it goes. So, you know, I've had traditional chefs say to me, well, agar gets like, it just keeps getting more firm over time. And so I don't like it, you know, it gets too rubbery. Well, adjust your agar, <laughs> you know, adjust your liquid. I just got a question um, okay. from Rachel. Uh, she's just wanting to know, I'm wanting to make marshmallow fluff using aquafaba that I can torch and it stays stable for four to five hours. I read to use gaga gum. Is this correct? Gaga gum. Um, I do when I want my aquafaba to be more marshmallowy. I add a bit of, I actually use a little bit of gorgum. You can use xanthan as well and it will get that way. I always, let's go back a sentence. I always start with reduced and chilled aquafaba. Now I know there are a lot of people who do not and say it works and maybe it does, but I want the most reliable start I can have. So I take that little bit of time and I reduce my aquafaba, whether it's homemade or from a can by a third the canned, usually I reduce by a third, homemade, maybe a little longer till it's viscous, chill it, store it in your freezer until you need it. So you start with that, some acid, I mean some stabilizer like cream of tartar, and which is very easy to access, or a little vinegar or a little lemon juice, that'll give you a little flavor. And then make sure to use, you You call it castor sugar, right? <laughs> the very yeah. finely ground sugar, which yeah. I grind vegan sugar in my, you know, my grinder for, and then I have castor sugar and then add it with the little bit of guar gum. If you use too much, you'll taste it. So you start with a little, you can always add more. It should hold for that many hours. But, you know, aquafaba is a funny thing. It's a wonderful thing. Oh, my God. Love it. Love it. Um, if it deflates, you just whip it back up. Just whip it back up. But, you know, in the course, we do we do baked Alaska, which, you know, and then I store my aquafaba sometimes already piped or whatever in the freezer. And it's, it works a charm. And then you just, it does, it just works a charm. <laughs> oh, wow. What a great tip. Yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't take your whole bowl and do it because I'm saying it works for me, but it, it works that way. And just recently I've added just the littlest bit of cornstarch when I'm making a pavlova. So it depends. Speaking of that, I just, I got a sample of the dried aquafaba powder. Have you used it? Yes, four. Um, I got some probably about two years ago, just when I started the group and I was using it and um yeah, it was great. I really liked it. It was yeah. easier. I didn't have so much uh, wastage of chickpeas because I couldn't oh. eat that much um, hummus and, you know, cans and stuff. Yeah, I like chickpeas. I found it had a little bit of a taste. It behaved a little differently. It certainly mm -hmm. worked up. But, you know, these are things that you have to observe yourself. So go ahead and, and try that. The marshmallow fluffy thing is just great. It's just great. It's really fun. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, Rachel's just replied again. She said she tried a gaga powder and the sugar melting process to add to the whipped aquafaba, and that did not work well. Wait, say that again. What What's the word you're saying? Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Guar gum or agar? So she said she tried um, a gaga powder as oh, well. Oh, agar powder. Oh, I yeah, don't have agar powder in my. No, 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 no. She wants to make like a marshmallow fluff thing. Yep. You want, well, marshmallows are very hard to make, so I'm, and people are doing it. People are doing it. Um, I think Hannah's doing it now, Hannah Kaminsky. And her recipes really work, so she's a resource, yes. Hannah Kaminsky. Yes, I think I just saw her po posting um, a new marshmallow recipe as well. Yeah, Hannah's, Hannah's fantastic. We just gave one of her books away as part of our um, yeah. She, she's amazing and as nice as can be. I've known her we've been so for cute. a really long time, a really long time. She's been doing this since she's in high school, I think. It's a quite yeah. Okay, so the agar, I misunderstood because I heard guar. <laughs> I don't know why, not agar agar. 
Uh, that would have to be treated very differently. Um, I would cook it with, I would cook the sugar. I'd make a sugar syrup. And then you would have to dissolve the agar. And agar has to cook. You know, it you have to hydrate it for a little while, just like gelatin. Mm -hmm. And then you can hydrate it for till next week. It's not going to do what it's supposed to do until it comes to a boil. So it has to boil. So that's a kind of a tricky-ish thing, but it's doable. So I have made a marshmallow fluff by using aquafaba, cream of tartar, whipping aquafaba with cream of tartar, adding castor sugar and guar gum or xanthan gum, and it gives it this marshmallowy, stretchy thing. So maybe, Rachel, maybe that will work for you. It won't make marshmallows, but it will make marshmallow fluff, definitely. There's, um, okay, thanks for answering that. Um, I just have one question that I've come across a lot in my career as a vegan baker and wanting to actually become a professional vegan chef. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other people have um, gone through this conundrum as well. So for me to get qualified, I would have to actually go study at a, um, just a general patisserie school, but I'm really not wanting to go mm -hmm. and do that. And I'm finding it hard how do I, when do I actually start, well, how can I start to qualify myself as a proper vegan baker or pastry chef, considering there's no actual real, there's no like industry standard qualification. I mean, we can do um, the Ruby school, there's other courses we can do, but how do, when can you certify yourself? Like what's your professional opinion? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and actually this very same question just came up in the professional in the group of working professional pastry chefs that happen not to be vegan. But there was a conversation in there this morning about is certification worthwhile? So there are many fine chefs who have never been to culinary school. That's just the truth. So it is possible. Um, we Ruby does offer a certification. You get if you complete if you pass the course and complete the course, you get a certification. Uh, if you were to go to a pastry school, you would okay. You're a graduate of whatever. You know, in today's world, there are so many courses where you go for four days or five days and you get a certificate. Does that make you certified? Mm. I don't really think so. I think. What you can do is you have to have a baseline. You have to know how to do things. So you can teach your, if you, if you can't go to a course or study with someone, then you can teach yourself techniques, take pictures, you know, study up and then find, see if you can find a mentor who will work with you. I have, you know, I, I mentored many people over these years who said, you know, I really want to do this work. And of course, when I was at the Natural Gourmet, they were students of the Natural Gourmet who had to do an internship. But there are ways to do it. You just go into a shop and or or a school and volunteer. Sometimes schools do have volunteers. It's it's a it's kind of a slippery slope for vegans because some, many vegans, and I'm not judging it, this is something that you have to decide for yourself, for sure. Mm. Won't go into a place that isn't strictly vegan. I made it my business to be in, stay in all the organizations that are, have some vegan people, but are tend to be traditional because I wanted to represent vegan that way. I felt mm. like the vegan community, they're going to be cool with me, but this other community needs more vegans. And yeah. so, you know, you might be able to go to a pastry shop or a restaurant or cafe or even a coffee shop that is doing some desserts and say, hey, you know, I would really like to study with who's doing your desserts. Can I work one day a week or can I assist with this person? And that is a way to do it as well. There is, 
for people in the States, although I think people may come in, Mark Reinfeld, Chef Mark, who has taught all over Europe, I know that, is building a brand new school as we speak, a vegan school that's going to have a pastry component. I'm going to do guest teaching there in Boulder, Colorado. So it's coming. It's coming. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of the traditional schools now, culinary schools, are offering vegan modules. This I know for sure. There's a wonderful school in Philadelphia. You know, I moved here two years ago called the Walnut Hill College. Top, top pastry course. And um, they have become very interested in vegan. I went in and did a talk for the students uh, just last week. They had, I did the talk just before they had their assignment that day. They had four hours to do work with alternative desserts. In other words, vegan desserts. So, you know, it can be a little tricky, but you, you need to persevere. You need to persevere and you need to be realistic. You know, there are a lot of people who say, well, I can't, you know, I can't find anybody. So I'm just going to open a place. Work first, <laughs> go and volunteer someplace before you just jump in and work some, you know, you, it takes yeah. a lot. You need to know all kinds of things before, but it's doable. Do it, you know, just mm. do it. Be professional, you know, get an apron, get a coat, tie your hair back, look the part. I never wear earrings when I'm working and I have awful nails because, you know, but they're clean and just present yourself that way and learn everything you can, learn everything you can from resources yeah. that make sense, that are vetted. I don't yeah. know if that answers your question because right now we don't have, well, the Institute of Culinary Education, which is both in New York and Los Angeles, so has folded in the Natro Gourmet program and they have, they are doing some vegan desserts. They are doing what was my vegan baking boot camp. But uh, there are ways that you can do this on your own too. Yeah, I think a lot of people have been in my position. Um, I'm living in New Zealand and it's pretty isolated yeah. and the vegan scene here isn't as big as everywhere else in the world. Uh, and to advance my skills, uh, I couldn't go to the, a school because there was no courses here. But I, I pretty much just bought every single baking book, non-vegan and vegan, I possibly uh -huh. could. I'm constantly trying to keep up with what's happening in the industry. I right. bake literally every day, all the time, learning about recipes, listening to influencers, connecting with people, watching what people are baking, uh, and just trying to create as many other opportunities for people in the scene as well so we can grow together as a community. Hence this interview right now. It's all about bringing the right people right. to the right space so we can all grow together because eventually vegan baking is going to become just a standard practice. It's standard very accessible absolutely. and obviously who are they going to ask who are they going to come to they're going to come right. to us right. and like they're already doing it with you Fran they're right. coming to Fran because she's been in the industry for over 25 years so that's why I think it's so important for this movement to have right. such a strong community you and need, you need to do the work you need to be yeah. in the kitchen I mean we're all really busy but if you're very interested in this but you still have a day job you know this is my day job, so it's a different situation, but I still have things I have to do, you know. Do you need to just keep practicing a recipe until a recipe that you deem good, worthy, and do it over and over again? And then see, is it different if I use oat milk from when I use soy milk from when I use this milk? What about if I use whole cane sugar or just cane sugar? And what are the differences in the different kinds of liquid sweeteners? This, this is, you'll start to know. Measure your batter so that you know you can go from one pan to another pan. I mean, the, mm -hmm. best, the, the best thing, you know, or not everyone can do it, I know, but this Ruby course, honestly, is, that's it. You know, you'll learn everything that you need to know. It is self-paced. Yep. We have a, it's, we have a payment plan, so you can pay over time. Yep. But and it's really reasonably priced, too. It's quite reasonable, it's quite reasonable Very but reasonable. You know, it depends who you are. So there's mm -hmm. a payment plan. But it thrills me because I have 
students in this course now from Albania, from Singapore, from South America, from Australia, yep. and all across the United States. So we interact with each other and learn, you know, I'm learning some ethnic desserts too. There happens to be a discount running right now through February 4th for the February class. So it's $20, 20% off, $100 off. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's that this course was built because there was nothing available in the world. There was just nothing available in the world. So where for some people it's like, I don't want to do that stuff. I don't want to know about weed. It's going to be boring. Well, then you're not going to be much of a pastry chef. You have to know. You know, I have a pet, a couple of pet peeves. Like, you know, if I go to a restaurant and they say, this cake is wheat free. And I'm like, what's it made out of? Spelt. Well, spelt is wheat, you know, or they'll say it's sugar free. Well, what did you sweeten it with? Well, coconut sugar. Well, co you know, like, no, it's still sugar. Let's, yeah. let's be the honest vegans and serve really fabulous desserts. You know, you don't have to have a giant repertoire when you're starting out. Learn to make a cookie, a cake, a muffin, a cupcake. You know, a book, by the way, that I really do recommend because I'm thinking about the aquafaba question is Ju Diva wrote a book called Aquafaba, actually. And she's a scientist. Mm -hmm. She has written a couple of books, and I had an opportunity to have lunch with her in San Diego. I get to do some really cool things like be a guest chef at the spa called Rancho La Puerta and cruise ships and things. So Ju met me and Turns out that she's really a scientist. So her aquafaba book I knew would really tell you the truth. <laughs> and it does, and her recipes are fabulous. And we had her as a guest on the Ruby course. So anybody who has been enrolled can go and listen to these, you know, live events at any time. But she's she's great. So there's a book that, you know, you can and if you don't want to spend all this money. We all have libraries. Get them from the library. You know, get mm -hmm. them from the library. But don't just go out there and pick a recipe from somebody you never heard of where there are no reviews and where, you know, once because I'm going to assume at this point you're practicing, you're going to wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. And try to really observe. For example, Vegan butter, which I didn't have, but I have now. <laughs> well, when I'm developing a recipe, if I'm converting a recipe from traditional and it's butter, dairy butter, to vegan butter, I use about 25% less vegan butter because what's vegan butter? It's oil that's been emulsified. Mm -hmm. So when it's yeah. melted, you need less. If you're really paying attention, you're going to notice that in your in your recipe, by the way, speaking of butter, you know, Miyoko and I go way, way back. She oh, used to do such it a with a with cheese in her suitcase, believe it or not. I just got um, a package with a sample of her new unsalted butter that will be out soon and her oat butter to die. To die. Oh, I'm sure. so lucky You're with all the good peeps. Oh my gosh. So, you know, and it's just extraordinary. The and but you can also go to her book, Homemade Vegan Pantry, and learn how to make butter yourself. And she's not the only one doing butter. I mean, you know, so you can you can do that too. You can you can do that too. It's just it's really I'm always lucky. There's just so many good products on the market now that are really fixing right? all these issues. It's yeah. true. there are good vegan marshmallows. I mean, there weren't yeah. vegan marshmallows when I was starting out. And the chocolate, people ask me, what's my favorite chocolate? Are you kidding? There's a new one every day. There's, you know, I was telling Sarah, I can't remember the name, but when I was in New Zealand two years ago, I spent a month there. I found a chocolate company, Bean to Bar, Fair Trade Organic Vegan. And it was near Wellington and it was absolutely out of this world. And another question I get about chocolate is, how do you know it's vegan? So I used to laugh in my head. I would never laugh at anybody and say, well, if it isn't milk chocolate, but that's not true anymore. You need to read the label because some of the dark chocolates have milk powder in them. 
or the mm. first few runs on a shared equipment, you're going to have a lot of milk, which is annoying for a vegan, but quite dangerous for someone with a milk allergy. So you choose a chocolate from a company that only does dark chocolate, you know, non-milk chocolates, and then it's good. But you need to do some tasting because they're not, you know, everyone's palate is different. And not, you know, what I think might taste dark, might taste sweet to some of you, but you need to use the percentage that's listed in the recipe. So, you know, all these that's, a, that's such a good point. I just want to flag that. Um, everyone's palates are different. Yeah. So really learning to understand your own palate and comparing it to other people. Like when I bake, I always try and get other people to taste my food because yes. I really love lemon and I make things extra lemony or extra tangy or too spicy because I just really enjoy those flavors. But it may be too much for the general person that's making a recipe. Uh -huh. So I think it's a great exercise to understand your own personal likings and then get other people to give you feedback on your food will really help you develop. Right. That is so true. hundred percent. I mean, I have a list, <laughs> I have a list of tasters because I want to know what other people think. Plus the fact is that you have to taste everything and even little teeny tastes of desserts and my desserts are not overly sweet, but they're dessert it kind of gets, I get a little like, whoa, where's my miso soup? You know, if you feel like you've had too much sugar in a day because you're in a baking frenzy. Yeah. And everybody, yeah. Mori seaweed, so sushi rolls and miso soup. That's the answer. Mm. <laughs> it really helps you. I learned that at Angelica Kitchen when I was the pastry chef there. We used to have nori rolls at the pastry stations from all the taste thing. So you can... Ah. But, you know, it's your recipe, so you make it the way you want. But it's that, okay, so I just said I don't like things super sweet. But my very first boss said to me, well, I was on this, like, I'm just, okay, now I'm making desserts, but they're not going to be so sweet. He said to me, so I took out too much of the sugar, and he said, Costigan, you're making brownies, not brown bread. Put some of the sugar back in. You know, it's <laughs> It's just, you learn these things, it's yeah. dessert. But when you're working without dairy, the flavors are actually louder. So there's a pastry chef in New York who's quite, he's the god of wedding cakes. Ron Ben Israel is his name. He had a show on Food Network. And, oh yeah, yeah. he's talking And his cakes, oh my God, I don't know, hundreds of, them. He's the nicest man. And he actually wrote a blurb for my book, which was something because he's certainly not vegan. But what he said to me in conversation was, he said, you know, you're right. The dairy mutes the flavor of chocolate. So he's mm. not. So you start to learn these things when you're doing vegan desserts and yeah. There isn't all that. Our desserts still have fat, unless it's a whole food plant-based, no oil dessert. But, you know, coconut cream and this and that, cashew cream, there's fat. But there's a difference. There's There can be a difference so that the flavors are really come through. Now, if you want to be really cool, you know, I don't use bottled lemon juice. I'd rather use fresh lemons. I'm with you on the give me a tart lemon yeah, any day. I just love it. Love it. I had three new lemon curds last week just because I was on a lemon kick. <laughs> and when I, I try to buy organic lemons, which is pretty easy for me to do, but they're a little mm -hmm. more money. So I so think that's a difference. So a big difference. I scrub it. And even if I don't need the zest right then, I don't want, I don't like food waste. So I zest mm -hmm. the lemon and then I save the zest and I'll put it in the freezer for when I might need it and then go oh, out yeah. the lemons. But, yeah. you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you know. can I just make a point to two points there? Um, when making lemon, using lemon zest, always use organic lemons because commercial lemons just have no flavor whatsoever. 
But the other really thing that the other great thing that I loved about your course, which I haven't really seen in um, anywhere else, was the way that you talked about the quality of ingredients, which I talk about a lot in my YouTube videos. Yeah. Like it's really important to use top quality ingredients, especially when you're using like vanillas and um, Ooh, yeah. other essences and flavorings and quality chocolate. And the other thing that you talk about in your course is uh, the health component, which I absolutely loved. Like when I was reading this section about oils, you were talking about like the stuff that's in the commercial canola oil that you buy and why it's no good for you and don't use it in your desserts. Instead, use an organic um, canola oil that's spray free. And here's alternative yeah. oils that you can use that are neutral, that are just as good, if not better, and more mm. healthier. And that was so refreshing because especially for me, because I'm baking all day, I'm tasting, and I'm also trying to be very aware of my health. Yeah. So if I am consuming these products, these desserts and bakes, I'm actually consuming the, the healthiest right. version. Right. It's a very really good point. I just loved that. You I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I actually, um, I went to the canola board. I was at a conference and the canola board was there. And I asked them, because when I, when I went to the, first went to the natural gourmet, so that's around 25 years ago, canola oil, and they were super careful about their ingredients. That was the oil that they used. Well, it turned, and I was like, what is canola oil though? There's no, what is it? So it's a made up name. It's Canadian oil. It's rapeseed oil. Oh, right. right. What I was told was that in America anyway, people were not buying an oil called rapes, rapeseed oil. <laughs> ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, so it has healthful components. The fatty acids are good in canola oil, but it is a very highly, it's a genetically, it's genetically modified. So the canola board told me this. It's genetically modified and heavily sprayed unless it's organic. Mm. So, okay, I just don't want that. You know, I don't want it. So I will either use organic canola oil. I like grapeseed oil for neutral oil, yeah. uh, sunflower oil for neutral oil. I don't use much coconut oil except where it matters. And I have found a neutral, rather neutral tasting extra virgin olive oil. That's really nice. That's really nice. Uh, yeah. That's that what in. I like using. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that too. Of course, in an Italian cake, you know, an Italian almond cake, which I have in my book. Um, I use an, an olive oil where I will taste some of it because it's fabulous, because it's really fabulous. But and then the, some of the fancier oils are for finishing because you don't want to bake with them. You know, mm. they're going to disappear. They're going to disappear. But if you use the best pistachios, you know, and, the, and fresh nuts, you're going to have the best tasting result right yeah. you know if yeah. you're, your nuts are rancid ick no matter you know so you need to taste things i used to say to people well we don't have to worry about salmonella because we are not using raw eggs we're not using eggs and this and that and the other thing but have you noticed that on the bags of flour now it says do not consume raw flour because even Top brands here have been recalled for salmonella in mm. flour, and it's the way the flour is stored or what happens to it. I had a, a total conversation, a huge conversation with um, a non vegan cake group about this because they were talking about how they'd just been infected with salmonella from eating raw cake batter. And I kind of made a comment going, Oh, well, I don't really have to worry about that because I'm vegan and none of there's no eggs or dairy. And um, I got schooled totally. They, uh, yeah. this sent me a report saying oh that's actually not true anymore because blah 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 and I was like oh, oh okay. right I had to change I had to change my little talk too about that because yeah yep. yeah so you know. it's good it's good to know but just to uh just to wrap up I just want to quickly talk about some key points that you've talked about which I think are, are really important so obviously Fran's course is a must do if that's if you're wanting to get really schooled in how to become a vegan baker or a pastry chef and you really want to get those foundation elements down I totally recommend looking at that course if you can't do a course definitely buy her books because she has such a wealth of knowledge and information. Um, she has, you know, YouTube videos talking about different things once a month through Ruby School, which are amazing. I love tuning into them. 
Um, some key points where, you know, just measure your ingredients. It makes a huge difference. Look at grams. Start to learn about the methods that you're losing, using when baking. Do multiple tests. Try different ingredients. Um, learn your palate. Uh, use use the best ingredients that you possibly can find and find mentors like in in my group in our group in our amazing group there are so many beautiful mm -hmm. professional people in there who are just helping people to know and they're helping you develop your baking skills to become a better mm -hmm. pastry chef to decorate your cakes you know so they're exactly if not better than non-vegan versions and if you're ever ever in doubt i mean fran's in the group she also runs her own fantastic uh facebook group essential vegan desserts so you can go right well that course is actually a private Thank group you. so it's only for people who are in the course but you can come you can always write to me at fran and fran .com. i would love it if you would follow my page fran Costigan, vegan pastry chef and yes. just Ask questions there because I'm, you know, I'm there pretty much poking in all the time. I have an Instagram account, a except for Fran Costigan, vegan pastry chef. I am good cakes can't Fran everywhere. So my, <laughs> my little granddaughter wants me to open a shop called Good Cakes Fran Land. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's adorable. That like, you, you know, if if you can follow directions, so I have these little kids in my life who come, you know, to visit every so often, and I have them making aquafaba because they can follow directions. So yeah. I, you know, in another incarnation, I was a kindergarten teacher, so I think I still have a little bit of that. But I say follow directions, read the recipe all the way through, gather everything, do your mise en place, get things toasted and cooled and all that kind of stuff. We go over that in the course. It's in my book. So I don't think I'm a boring person, but I I mean, I have, but you really, you want a really good result. I want us to represent the best and it's, it's available. It's absolutely available. And everybody's and catching on. Everything you just said um, reminds me of when I was talking with Gretchen Price as well. She was saying similar things, is that we forget that uh, baking and, and making pastries is a science. Like it's a formula. Yeah. So, and you know, friend, you spend hours and hours and days testing a single recipe. Right. Um, it would be amazing in another interview just to talk about your actual process of how you create a recipe because there's so much that goes into it that people just aren't aware of. Um, so it is a formula and everything that Fran does in her recipes is for a reason. She's just not putting, you know, 382 grams of flour in there because she likes that number. It's a specific measurement that she's come to to create the recipe to make the best possible version mm -hmm. that it is. So it all, everything she does matters and has a reason and a purpose. So, you know, definitely take everything she says to heart and follow it the best way you can because I feel that is a great way to learn everything that she has um, created over like 25 years of doing this. She's right. like, you are the queen of vegan right. baking. Uh, you are the, you are the queen you the top. Know, don't despair either. Go into it with a happy heart and, and just observe because there are days where I say, you know, I said this to Sarah earlier, oh, you know, I don't like waste, but this is almost okay. You can only change one thing at a time. You have to know when you can. But if you if you yep. make something and it's good, but maybe the center just didn't bake right because you filled your pan too high, perhaps. Mm. Don't Julia Child said, never apologize. <laughs> and just let the cake cool, get it cold, cut out the center. Somebody dropped my bouche de Noel beautiful on the way to the table but it fell yeah. face up i put out a trifle bowl and i made a trifle so oh, you know, right. there there are things that you can that you can do you know i actually met julia and um this was it was i saw her at a conference she was all alone i'm like this is your opportunity and i said hello because i you know as a new married i was baking out of her book he used every bowl in the house and pot and pan to make this chocolate mousse and she leaned down and she said what do you do dearie 
And I go, oh my God, I'm gonna tell Julia Child I bake with that dairy and butter. And I did. <laughs> And she was just one of these people like us who was curious about why things work and how they work. And she talked to me about it. She said, how interesting, how interesting. And she wanted to know some specifics. So, you know, I think for us, it's important not to go in and make the other people wrong. You know, mm -hmm. this is what we do. I'm interested in what you do. You might be interested in what I do. And let the food speak for itself, you know, serve something that's attractive. Doesn't have to be like, you know, I'm not a major cake decorator. It just wasn't where my interest was. There are people who do such beautiful work. I mean, I see it by swoon. Um, mm. Give me a little couple of little edible flowers and, you know, and I'm happy and some cream. But serve proudly. And don't serve something that didn't work out. And again, test little bitty quantities, but keep going because a light bulb will go off. You'll start to see. People with pie dough, pastry dough, tend to get very nervous in the course. Well, whoever made good pie dough the first time out or the second time, you have to get oh, it. Yeah. Yep. You just learn. You just totally. Learn. Yeah. I mean, Whenever I'm doing a new recipe, I always expect the first one to fail. And then it's just they fail less the yeah. more I go along until I just get to that stage where the recipe is good. Like, really so, good. And I, I, I consistently, constantly have fails in the kitchen. But the great thing about failing so often is that I know so much now and I can tell people what not to do. Right. You learn things from something not working out and it happens to me to this day it happens to me where i might overheat something that's happening and then oh my gosh look at all this oil the oil has separated out or the something has gotten grainy well i've learned how to fix it sometimes it works <laughs> sometimes yeah. it doesn't so you try to pay attention but yeah. again you know little little bits of things will you just get it and then it's so exciting sometimes the first time does work but not not very often or you know i don't know just lucky. just don't yeah it's like lucky but then you have to say what did i do so yeah I do everything from talking into a microphone i make myself write things down because i'm very i'm much more of a really in the moment kind of person when I love to cook, I'm actually a very good savory cook, but you know, you can fix cook thing. You know, you can fix savory food a lot more easily, right? Well, <laughs> while it's cooking, you can't fix your cake when it's in the oven. <laughs> Such a good point. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, the more, the more I burn, the better I get. <laughs> right. Another thing is don't rush. Don't rush because cakes need to be cooled on a cooling rack and then turned out of the pan and then mm, cooled yep. completely. And I find that before you want to tort them or work with them or any way or frost them, it works much better. It works best when they're very cold. Frostings have to set up. So it's, you know, in my book, I do what I call game plans because that's the only way I can really do it is this is the order and literally well maybe not my cheesecake but almost every cake that i have can be frozen and defrosted and cookie oh, that's right almost all of the icings too so i can always have people over <laughs> and you know because there's always something in my freezer and there are simple things you can do too you know you can say this week i'm going to learn how to make a really reliable ganache and then try with different chocolates till it's one that tastes good to you. Try with mm. different milks because they will behave differently. I have mm. one that's made with orange juice and tahini that's really nice. Oh. And, oh, it's really. Oh, my God. Nice. I have to check that out. That it's sounds amazing. amazing. Book. You'll see it. Oh. But then you have a beautiful baguette. Toast it. Put some nice olive oil on it. Spread the baguette with this ganache, a little sprinkling of, of course, sea salt. You've got a chocolate crostini. Put some of the ganache in a beautiful, delicious midjole date. You know, maybe put a hazelnut in there too, or a piece of walnut or something, and you've got something to serve. 
So you have this one recipe that can be truffles, a cake glaze, depending on the proportions. Because what's ganache? It's just, it's an emulsion, but it's different. You get different uses from a proportion. So study that for a while. You know, study mm. vanilla cake for a while. Study Sarah's lemon for a while until you get that knocked off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we've gone over a little little bit over time, yeah. but oh, I've so enjoyed talking to you. You just had you just shared such amazing knowledge, and it's just great listening to your experience and stories and advice. Uh, I'm sure everyone has pretty much just been listening to you nonstop because we haven't had very many questions because yeah. we're just yeah. so well. It's been really happy. fun for me. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll see you in the group. Yes, and look, everybody, I'm going to make some show notes for this episode because Fran just recommended so many great resources and places to go. I'll put a special link up to her school on the pay, on my website page as well. Uh, and I'll also have this recording up there, which you can revisit and listen to again to get all those juicy little facts and trips and tricks and tips and I'm back into those beautiful baking brains of yours. So thank you so much, Fran. You're such a superstar. Well, thank you. And don't forget to go to my go to my website, francostigan.com, sign up for my yes. blog, and you'll yes. get Sarah's recipe and a chance to win a copy of her wonderful ebook. So yes. We've got lots awesome. of people looking at that. Don't forget to do that. Have a great day or night wherever in the world you are. And Sarah, it was really fun. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Thanks, everybody. I'll chat to you in the group. Bye. Bye.